So the topic for this video is the proof of the two de Morgan's laws in classical propositional logic. So we are going to show that these two results here, which are the two de Morgan's laws, can be derived from the other rules of inference in classical propositional logic. That's what we're going to do in this video. Most people, when they try to prove these results, try to do it with truth tables. I am not going to do that. I do not like truth tables, and let me explain the reason why. When you study logic, there is a reason that we study logic, and it is not to be able to solve logic problems. Logic problems, like knights and knave problems, those are the classical logic problems, you can present those to a lay person on the street who has never studied propositional logic, formal logic, and they can work them out using naive logic that everyone knows. If they're reasonably intelligent, they will be able to work out logic problems, and the way that they will do that is through brute force. They will go through the different options and they will find out which ones work and which ones don't work. That is all you are really doing in a truth table. You are going through every possible option. It's, it therefore really is just a very neat, precise way of doing the same thing that an ordinary person could do without ever having studied formal logic. Now, there is more to truth tables than that. Inside the truth tables, are the rules of inference, but most people using truth tables, or a lot of people that I've seen who do things in logic just with truth tables, they often don't actually appreciate the rules of inference, and they don't appreciate that these truth tables that they are building up contain within them the rules of inference, that to derive the results in the truth table, they are implicitly using the rules of inference. They don't acknowledge that, and that is the whole point of studying formal logic. One, to develop formal language for the logical connectives, things like and, or, implication, biconditional implication. But more than that, it's to study the properties of these concepts, because it, formal logic is not just a language, it's a formal language for concepts that are incredibly deep. These logical connectives, they exist beyond the language. You know, the concept of and, you might think that's just a word in the English language, but no, you'd be wrong. It's a lot word in every language. All the languages on the earth, now I'm not a language expert, but I presume that all the languages on the earth have an equivalent uh, word for and. It's a crucial concept, it's a crucial logical concept, and it exists beyond our languages. It's a deep philosophical thing that we're discussing here. That concept of and, the concept of or, the concept of implication, the concept of biconditional implication, these exist beyond language. They are deep concepts. And we are studying the rules that those concepts obey, and those are called the rules of inference. They are the axioms of logic. You have used these all your life without, take, without acknowledging them, taking them for granted. But that's the purpose of the study of logic, to finally look at these most foundational rules that we are using to think and deduce things, and finally acknowledge they are there. And when we are making when, when we are having thought processes, we are now going to break them down into these axioms of thought, these rules of inference that we are using. That is the whole point of studying logic, to acknowledge this deep philosophical truth. This is really deep stuff that you do in logic. It's, it's beyond maths, really. It's mathematical philosophy. Philosophy students learn this as well as mathematical students. Uh, it's the bridge between mathematics and philosophy. As I say, it's called mathematical philosophy. It's very, very deep stuff. So it's crucial, in my opinion, when you do things in logic to actually acknowledge the rules of inference. That's the whole point of studying this. Uh, so we are not going to 
prove these results with truth tables because, as I say, often the people using truth tables don't acknowledge the rules of inference that go into creating those truth tables. They just do it because, of course, they understand it, but they're not actually acknowledging the rules of inference that they're using to construct those truth tables. So we're not going to do truth tables. We're going to do this via the rules of inference, the axioms of logic. An important point is that we are going to be doing classical logic in this video. So people disagree on which axioms should be allowed in logic, and this leads to different forms of logic where you're allowed to use different axioms. So there is classical logic, and then there is something called intuitionistic logic. Now, in classical logic, you are allowed to use arguments which involve proof by contradiction, and that's because we are allowed to use an axiom called the law of the excluded middle. In intuitionistic logic, they remove that axiom, and it removes your ability to do proof by contradictions, because proof by contradictions re 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 rely on the law of the excluded third, or the law of the excluded middle, being true. So, we're not going to do intuitionistic logic. In fact, a huge number of our arguments to derive these results are going to rely on proof by contradiction. So, we're doing classical logic, uh, which is the main form of logic that most mathematicians accept. So, let's begin then. So, we'll start off with rule number one. And I should just say, before we actually begin, I hope you understand what these rules mean. And I hope, just with your naive logic, you can appreciate why they're going to be true. You know, again, if you go to a layperson on the street and you explain to them what these symbols actually mean, um, after 10 minutes of explanation, they probably will be able to understand why these are true. Uh, so let's just go through that briefly. If we're saying not P and Q, that means that not both P and Q are true together. That should be the same thing as not P or not Q, where, of course, or in logic is defined differently to how or is defined in English. In English, when we say or, we're meaning exclusive or. You know, if I say uh, I want you to buy either a blue car, a blue car or a black car, it means I want you to come back with either a blue car or, exclusively or, a black car. I don't want you to come back with a car that is both blue and black. I'd be very upset if you come back with a stripy car. Uh, whereas in logic, or means it's either that one or it's that one or it's both of them. Um, so I hope the intuitive view can see how if it's not P or it's not Q or it's both not P and not Q, all of those scenarios are equivalent to it not being P and Q. Now looking at this one here, so not P or Q. So P or Q means it's either P or it's Q or it's both of them. Not that means that it's going to need to be not P and not Q. So again, hopefully you can appreciate why this law is going to be true. This is even more a reason why I don't see the point of proving these with truth tables, because intuitively you can understand why these rules work. So really the whole point of trying to prove these is trying to prove that you can do them from the foundational rules of inference, that they don't need to be axiomatized in themselves, that they can be derived from the other rules of inference that you have already axiomatized in your theory of logic. Um, you know, the results aren't that incredible. What's incredible is that they can be derived from these other axioms that we've already got, uh, and that's what we're going to now do. So let's begin then. The formal proof of the top one here. So this is an if and only if statement, a biconditional statement. And there is a rule of inference that tells us how we can construct biconditional propositions. And it's called biconditional introduction because we want to introduce the biconditional logical operator. 
It's also called if and only if introduction because the other name for this is the if and only if logical operator. So this rule of inference says that you can have this, you can construct this if you have these two things, which are unidirectional implications. So they're both directions of this arrow, if you like. So we need this way, which is that not P and Q implies not P or not Q, but then we also need the other way around. So we need not P or not Q implies not P and Q. So if we have these two propositions, by a rule of inference called by conditional introduction, we then have this. So we need, therefore, to show that these two things are true. So we'll start with this one here. So to arrive at an implication, again, there is a rule of inference that tells us how to derive an implication, and it's called implication introduction. So it says that you start with this, so you take this as a premise, and what you need to do is you need to show that from this, you can arrive at this. And then if you can do that, then you have this whole implication proposition. You can have that. That's the rule of implication introduction. It's another rule of logic, another rule of inference. So how are we going to do this then? Well, this is where this starts to get complicated. We are going to use proof by contradiction to derive that this comes from this. Another name for proof by contradiction or something that's entirely entangled with proof by contradiction is what's called negation introduction, which is the actual name for proof by contradiction as a rule of inference. This is a complicated rule of inference. We're going to use it a lot in this video. So if it's a rule of inference that you find difficult to understand, hopefully by the end of this video, you will be more comfortable with it, as you have seen loads of examples of its use. Up here, I've written what negation introduction is all about. So I've, I'm using different symbols now because I don't want to confuse you with P and Q. So we're using S and phi as propositions now. Uh, so what negation introduction as a rule says is that if you want to arrive at not S, the way you can do this is by considering S, and if you can show that by assuming S as a premise, you would arrive at a contradiction, i.e. you would arrive at phi, and you would arrive at not phi, then you have not S. So going over that again, here we are saying that if from the S proposition, you can arrive at both phi and its negation, then that's a contradiction because not phi, you can't have phi and its negation as propositions. That's the law of non-contradiction. It's a fundamental rule of logic. Um, it's, one of, it's one of Aristotle's ancient laws of thought that a thought and its negation are opposite to one another. You have one or you have the other. The law of the excluded middle is then that there is no third option. Either the thought prevails or its negation prevails. There isn't a third option. And those are things that we all we accept in classical logic, the law of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. And they give rise to negation introduction as a rule of inference in classical logic. So again, negation introduction says that if you want to arrive at not S, what you need to do is show that S leads to both phi and not phi for some phi, and that's a contradiction, so you can't have S, so you must have not S. And that's a rule of logic in classical logic. So here, not S is going to be this. This is going to take the place of not S in this argument. And then S is going to be the negation of not S, which is this thing. So we're going to assume this we're going to arrive at some contradiction, so we'll find out what phi and not phi are going to be equal to, and then we'll have that we must therefore have the negation of s, which, if you like, is going to be the negation of this thing that we're letting equal s, and then double negation cancels out, and you then just get back to this. Again, the fact that double negation cancels out is called the law of double negation, and again, it's entangled in. 
It's the same thing as Aristotle's old laws of thought. It's the law of the excluded third, that there is no other option. Either you have a fourth P, or you have its negation not P. There is no third option, so not not P is back to being P. So I'm going to now accept this then, and arrive at a contradiction which will then allow me to say that not this must be true, which goes back to being this. So here we go. So the way we do this is by noting that if I had this, I would also have P and I would have Q. Now, how do I show this? Well, again, I'm going to do this by proof by contradiction. And this is where this argument gets really complicated because we're going to do a proof by contradiction within our bigger proof by contradiction to arrive at P and Q. So let me show this for P. So to arrive at P then, I'm going to do negation introduction again, proof by contradiction. And now I'm abbreviating in order to avoid having to write negation introduction out. I'm just writing negation i for introduction. So I'm going to assume not p then and arrive at a contradiction. So if I were to assume not p, then my claim is I would also have not p or not q. And this follows by disjunction introduction or or introduction, which is another rule of inference in classical logic. So this means or. It's also called the disjunction. And if you have something, if you have a proposition, then you also have this as a larger proposition where you have that proposition or something else. So if you have this, then you of course have this because you having this qualifies you for having this just by the meaning of the disjunction, of, by the meaning of or. So if you had this, you also have this. You don't need to have this in order to have this. Just having this is enough because this says either this or this or both of them. If you are given that you have this, then you automatically have enough to qualify for this. So disjunction introduction says that if you have this, you can have this or whatever. And I didn't even need to put not Q here. I could have put T for goodness sake, where we haven't even defined what the proposition T is. Uh, disjunction introduction is a very open rule of inference because as soon as you're given that you have one thing, then you have that thing or something else as well. Uh, you know, if you're given that the car is red, then the car is red or green is true as well. You know, you're given that proposition, that thought also. Um, it might not be true that the car is green, but it is true that the car is red or green. Uh, so disjunction introduction there. So if I'm given this, I have this, but then I've arrived at a contradiction there because now I have this and I have not this. So that's a contradiction. So that means that this cannot have been true. So we are now allowed to introduce the negation of this. So we have not this. And then by double negation, the law of double negation, the law of the excluded third, not not P is the same thing as P or back to P. Um, so therefore we have P. If we have this, we have P, is what I've just proven. The same argument holds for Q, so it's exactly the same argument. I'm not going to write it down again. So you do a proof by contradiction, negation introduction, so you'd assume the negation of what you're trying to prove, so you'd assume not Q this time. And then if, you're, if you have not Q, you then also have not Q or not P, again by disjunction introduction. So this time not Q would be in this position and not P would be in this position, but they're the same thing. So you have this again, and then you've arrived at contradiction because you have this and you have not this. So by uh, negation introduction, you then have not the original thing, which was not Q. So you have not not Q, uh, which is then the same thing as Q by the law of double negation. So what I've just shown is that if we have this, then we have P and we have Q. So time for another rule of inference. So if you have the two propositions P and Q, then you have also the third proposition P and Q. Uh, that's by rule of inference called conjunction introduction that says that if you have two propositions, then you have the third proposition, which is P and Q. That's a really simple one to understand. That makes perfect sense from our understanding of how and the logical operator and works. 
But this is the problem, you see. This is where we complete our proof by contradiction. We were assuming as our premise not P and Q, and we were trying to derive this. And the way we were doing that is by assuming the opposite of what we wanted to derive, the negation of it. And we were trying to arrive at a contradiction. Well, here we have a contradiction. We've arrived at P and Q, which is directly in contradiction with this, which we were assuming as our premise. So this completes the negation introduction. This would give rise to this, which contradicts this. Therefore, by negation introduction, we have the negation of this. So we have not this. So we have not not, not P or not Q. And then by the law of double negation, the law of the excluded third, this is the same thing as not P or not Q. So what we have managed to show is that given this, we must have this. And then by if introduction, we can write that we then have this. So we have shown this first one here. So we now want to show the other way round. So we want to show this here. I've copied it down because it's quite a way up now. Uh, so again, to show this implication proposition, we're going to use the rule of inference that is implication introduction. And I've used the shorthand for implication introduction. So this means implication. Again, that means I. And remember, implication introduction says that to have this, what you must show is that if you take this as a premise, so you assume this, then you can arrive at the consequence here, this part of the statement. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're, we need somehow to break down this. We need to remove the disjunction. So there is a rule of inference that tells you how you can remove the disjunction, remove logical or, and that's called or elimination or disjunction elimination. Now, again, this is not a simple rule of inference. Conjunction introduction and conjunction elimination are really simple laws of inference. Disjunction introduction is a simple rule of inference. Disjunction elimination, however, is a difficult rule of inference. So I'm just going to go over what it says here. So it says that if you are given a disjunctive proposition, so S and T are some propositions, and then you are not given S and T, you are given instead the proposition S or T. You're given that that you, it prevails, that as a thought prevails. Um, how can you arrive at other conclusions from this? Well, disjunction elimination says that if you are given some other propositions, some more things that are going to be allowed, then you can arrive at something. So the things you need are you need the proposition that S implies X and T implies X. If you're given these two things as true, then, and you're given this, then you can arrive at X. And hopefully this makes logical sense as to why this would be a rule of inference. What this is saying is that if you have S or you have T, so that means either S or T or both of them, and you're given that if you have S, you have X, and you have that if you have T, you have X, then this with this means that you must have X because this gives you that you must have S or you must have T and these give you that both of these lead to X. So overall you can conclude or you can have the proposition X if you're given all of these three propositions. So that's how we're going to approach this. So what we need therefore is if we want to arrive at this, what we want is these statements here. These are the equivalent of these. So we want that not P implies this thing and not Q implies this thing. If we had these two statements, and we need to show these two statements because we don't have them yet, we need to understand that these are going to be true. Um, if we had these, given that we're given this, then we would have this. And that would then complete implication introduction and we'd be allowed to have our full proposition here. So we need to show these then. So the proof for each of them is going to be exactly the same, so I'll just do one of them. So we'll do this one here. So we want to show this proposition that not P implies not P and Q. So again, we're going to use implication introduction to show this, which says that 
you assume the premise, assume the antecedent in the implication statement. So you assume not P, and you need to arrive at not P and Q, the consequent. So we're going to do this by a proof by contradiction again. So assume the opposite then, which is P and Q. If you had P and Q, you'd then have P, and we're actually using a very simple rule of inference that we haven't yet seen, which is conjunction elimination, which says that if you're given something of this form, so P and Q, that you have both of the things that make this up, so you have P and you have Q. So if this is given, then you have P and you have Q from that. So from this, you can derive P, so P is given now, but then that's a contradiction because you have now got not P, which we were assuming here, and you have P. So by negation introduction, you can then say you must have the opposite of this as this leads to a contradiction. So you have the negation of it. So you have the negation of P and Q. And therefore, by assuming this, we have shown that we must have this. And therefore, by implication introduction, we have this. The same thing applies to this. Uh, it's just Q now takes the place of P. So again, uh, to show this, you'd use implication introductions. You'd say assume not Q and arrive at not P and Q. You'd do it by contradiction. So you'd say if the opposite were true, so if we had P and Q, well then we'd have Q by conjunction elimination, and then that's a contradiction because we have not Q. Therefore, this thing cannot be true. Its negation must instead prevail. So we have not P and Q. So we therefore have not Q implies not P and Q. So now we have shown that we have these two things. So by disjunction elimination, if we have this and we, as we've shown, we have these two things, then we have this. And by implication introduction, you now have this whole statement. So coming back up to the top now, what we have shown is both of these two propositions are true. And then by biconditional or if introduction, you then have that this is true. So we have proven the top one of de Morgan's laws. Let's now move on to the second one here. So I've moved down the blackboard and I have copied the second of the two de Morgan's laws down here. So we want to show this biconditional statement. Now this should be a nice reinforcement because we're going to use all the same rules of inference that we've just used to prove the first one. So by by conditional introduction, if and only if introduction, in order to arrive at this, we need to have these two unidirectional implications. So we'll start by trying to show this first one, and then we'll move on to showing the second one, and then we'll have shown the whole thing. So to prove the first one then, so we want to use implication introduction, so we need to assume this as the premise, and we need to arrive at this, and then if we can do that, then we have this by implication introduction. So how are we going to do this? Well, we somehow want to get this. So in order to get this, by conjunction introduction, if we had not P and we had not Q, then we'd have that. So let's try and get not P and let's try and get not Q. So we want to use negation introduction to do that because we want those negations of P and Q. So we're going to do proof by contradiction. That is what negation introduction is all about. So assume the opposite, assume P and arrive at a contradiction. Well, if you were to assume P, then by disjunction introduction, you also have P and Q. And I apologize, some of these are a bit um, off level, but this should correspond to this one here. So by or introduction, disjunction introduction, you would then have P or Q. But that's a contradiction because we're assuming not P or Q. So we've got P or Q and not P or Q. Contradiction, and therefore by negation introduction, you must have not P. So we've arrived at not P. So if this is true, you have not P. Now the same thing for Q. So we want not Q. So by negation introduction, assume the negation of not Q. So assume Q and then arrive at a contradiction. So if you assume Q again by or 
introduction, you have P or Q, but that's again a contradiction. So you can't have Q, you instead have not Q. So we've shown that if this is true, you have both not P and not Q. And then by conjunction introduction, if you have those two, then you have not P and not Q. So what we've shown is from that, you can derive this. And that's enough for using implication introduction, you then have this. So for the final one, um, I'm doing it over here, and interestingly, we actually get to use another rule of inference that we haven't yet used in this video, so this is going to be interesting. So we want to show this then. So again, by implication introduction, to arrive at this, you need to assume the antecedent, so this, and you need to arrive at this, and then you will have this. So we assume the antecedent then, so we have this, so by conjunction elimination, if you have this, you have both of the parts in the conjunction. So you have not P and you have not Q. So we have these two propositions. Now, we're trying to show that we have this. So again, we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume the opposite. We're going to arrive at a contradiction and then by negation introduction, we'll have the negation of this. So assume P or Q and arrive at a contradiction and then we'll have not P or Q. So if we have P or Q, this is a problem with us having these two things. And what we're actually going to use here is called disjunctive syllogism. So I've just written up here to give an example of what disjunctive syllogism says. So it says that if you have the proposition T or S and you have not T, then from those two, you have S. And again, that's perfectly sensible. You know, if you have that the car is red or the car is green, and you have that the car is not red, then you have that the car is green. And I'm kind of wishing I'd used the letters R and G now. Uh, but I hope that makes sense. If you have, if either T, this says either T or S or both, if you then have not T, then the only option left is that you have S. So disjunctive syllogism is the rule of inference that says that that is allowed in logic. Uh, it's the formalization of that intuitive notion. So we all, you know, this is what logic is all about. These things are not complicated. We're using these rules all the time. We use them from very young ages all the time to make logical reasoning. Uh, to think logically, now all we're doing is actually acknowledging that these are the rules that our brains are using all the time, that this is how it works. Uh, so this is a formal axiomatization of something that is plain common sense, but we're finally acknowledging that that's how our brain is working. It's using this rule fundamentally, and that's what all of logic is about acknowledging these rules that our brain has been using for years and years and years, but we're finally going to actually acknowledge that those rules are there. And the great power of this is that you can finally start to think about what would happen if we changed the rules. And that's what people do in uh, different forms of logic, like intuitionistic logic. They banish certain rules and then see if you can still derive certain results without those other rules. But we're not doing that. We're just doing classical logic, uh, where we uh, are finally just learning to recognize these fundamental laws, deep philosophical laws here about how these logical concepts in our brain are working. So if you have T or S and you have not T, then you have S. That's called disjunctive syllogism. It's a rule of inference. So we know, so we're assuming we have P or Q, but we know we have not P. So by disjunctive syllogism, we then have Q, but we also have not Q. So we have a contradiction there. We have Q and not Q. Therefore, by negation introduction, we have not this. So we have not P or Q. So what we've shown is that if you have this, you then have this. So by implication introduction, you finally have this. So overall now, we've clearly shown that we have this one and this one, and then by biconditional introduction, we have this one. So we have therefore shown uh, the second of the two de Morgan's laws. So overall, what we have shown is that these two rules, these two laws of logic, they don't need to be axiomatized themselves. 
in classical logic, they can be derived from the other rules of inference that are allowed in classical logic. If you struggle with logic, and you think that this is a huge number of big, big words for what is essentially common sense, then you are right. Classical logic is the logic of common sense, but it is a deep examination of the logic of common sense. It is looking deeply at the rules that our brains are using to make common sense logical judgments. Deeply examining those rules that you have previously all your life probably taken for granted. And the power of that is that you can then finally start to appreciate those rules, those axioms that this universe seems to obey. And some people then go on to think about if we changed these rules of common sense and made them less commonsensical, what would change? And that's the great power of logic. That's where it goes. Uh, but it is a very deep topic and people do struggle initially to understand what on earth this is about. So we'll end there. Thank you for watching and I hope that you've managed to follow what we've done in this video and gain something from it and hopefully even enjoyed it. Thank you.